Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 470. That's 470 of the Agassino Zynga show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe and of course leave you a comment and a little message down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions and of course if you're listening via the podcast app, a five star review and a share will help get the show spread out there nice and loud, nice and big. I would really appreciate that. Oh my god, here we are, here we are back again. Still leaking, still sweating, still feeling damp and moggy and stuff because, you know, unfortunately, I seem to have the body where no matter how warm it is, I just get really, really sweaty, really, really leaky, really, really quickly. And um, this weather, this sort of heat wave we're having at the moment in England has been both a blessing and a curse it's a blessing because when you go outside you don't have to worry about you know wearing a jacket or keep making sure you have an umbrella in your bag just in case it ends up pouring you can just about you know manage to get by with wearing a t-shirt all day which is always welcomed in the summer you don't really want to feel like you're wearing too many layers but then for someone like myself with the prevalence of sweating copious amounts just standing around and then also the flipping um random asthma attacks i get from time to time and hay fever it's just been an absolute horror show of a summer i have to be honest i've been spending most of my time making sure that i'm just not going to end up choking in my sleep or something but hey you know what we are where we are we who we are who we are it is what it is do the best with the options and the tools we are given but yeah, apart from that, it's been a pretty decent couple of weeks, I'd say, for myself for a week past so much. Been just trying to keep my head down, keeping, making sure I'm training, going to the gym a bunch, eating as best as I can, and obviously making sure I'm running. I did a couple of miles today, did two, hopefully going to crank that up again further than a week. I'm just trying to get my endurance back up and where it needs to be before I start worrying about my pace at the moment. It's super shit. I'm running like, you know, anywhere between like nine to 10 minute miles, but I just want to make sure that I'm getting the consistency up and making sure that I'm going out every week and then building it up, building it up. And then hopefully I'll get back to where I was before, which is that my peak was around, you know, seven minute miles, 7.20, 7.50, you know, sometimes on my slow day. Um, and that would of course equate to about what the best 26, 27 minute 3K or 5K, sorry. At the moment now, my 5K will be about over the half an hour mark so i definitely have a long way to go but um it's been a fun ride to get all that back up and running where it should be so that's been pretty decent and that's kept me kind of well behaved because you know i've got to make sure that i wake up in the morning got to make sure that i'm waking up at a certain time in the morning actually before work so i can obviously get get running and obviously got to make sure that i'm just you know generally in tip-top condition so i'm not you know kind of sacking off a couple of days here and there to nurse hangovers and whatnot so that's been pretty decent what else has been happening I did have this kind of idea briefly of going to the possessions party in Paris. You know, they're doing they're throwing a few from July all the way up through to August. I think they put up some links on their Instagram. I'm not too sure if they're still available. If you're not, if you're not kind of you know um, sure what possessions is, but possessions is um this uh, techno party collective out there in France. They do loads of events. So I say France, maybe Paris specifically, but they do loads of events anywhere out there um, in really random locations. You know, they do them in warehouses and whatnot, and sometimes just abandoned sort of like lots they did a couple during the start of sort of lockdown the covid restrictions when it was a bit more loose and you could gather outside in um, large amounts they did a couple which looked really fun and i think a few of their videos went viral because of just how kind of electric it is they've got this really well viewed boiler room i think for maybe a couple of years ago that's got like you know in the millions of views and it looks like a legit party probably the only boiler room party i've seen outside of a berlin one and that festival in ireland called um ava ava right those are usually the ones that have the best sort of crowds but then i think a close third or second would be definitely this one in um paris called uh, possessions and they do a few and i was kind of tempted to buy a ticket and get a eurostar and all that malarkey because you know you can kind of um enter to f enter into france freely of course if you're vaccinated and stuff you maybe have to prove i think your negative rate so you may have to get tested still if you've got double jab but you know you can get around that pretty easily i was thinking okay let me jump on a eurostar you know um and just kind of go in on a saturday early morning or evening and then come back at the first train back home in the morning basically and not have to pay for accommodation just go there to rave and then i looked up the location where exactly it is and it's not exactly in paris it's sort of like half an hour outside of paris mostly in the sort of like 
you'd say in the suburbs or maybe in the suburbs as a hood usually no usually in paris the other way around usually the further out you go the more kind of ghetto it gets so that's usually where all the kind of blocks are and the you know and the kind of estates so i'm assuming it's around that sort of area i'd imagine that's where they can probably get away with doing a bit, bit more of a larry party without worrying about police too tough so that's going to happen and it looks really nice don't get me wrong it looks flipping amazing um, tickets are only like 25 euros it's like when you consider you know how good the party is going to be how the, the the great DJs are going to get who aren't going to be the usual ones you see on everyone's kind of lineup they kind of do well at kind of promoting people within their local scene which is always kind of great and in general it just looks like a proper party so that was what I was going to do but again considering the amount I have to pay for the euros the euros is only the thing that kind of fucks it because the euros are so expensive it's still like you know at the cheapest to go one way it's like 49 quid and then coming back is always 99 so you're always paying above 100 euros to go which is always a bit of a letdown so that's probably why i just kind of sacked up and said you know what by the time i get there get my drinks and all that stuff it's just going to be too much it's gonna end up being like a 500 quid weekend in it or day out and i want to make it you know as economic as possible but also kind of have some fun so i thought you know what instead of doing that and rushing it might be best just to kind of put my head down keep training and just wait until things open up and things are going to be opening up soon around here we've got what date is it they've said in mind the 19th of july now so far so the um the sort of like stretch goal of us maybe having the ability to go out on the 15th was it 15th was i say the 15th yeah th that's completely been sacked off now no one's really gonna do that so that's kind of been put off for now so we're going to always look forward to the 19th as our kind of quote-unquote freedom day and i don't think it's too far to wait to kind of you know be able to rave in my city and be able to do that and i think it might be beneficial to just for the first one to be able to do it at your home turf um because like i've mentioned in previous shows i'm kind of out of the loop my cardio and stamina isn't where it kind of should be so i need to get give myself as much possible time to recover to get to where i need to get to so i can be my best self when i'm on the dance floor in it that's what i basically need to do and um i'm waiting for that so hopefully that happens very very soon and um yeah i'm just not i'm not even worried about which rave i go to on the 19th i just want to go to one like i said it's going to be sober raving day i'm going to go completely stone cold sober make might get a cheeky little san pellegrino in me or something is it san pellegrino you know that that drink with that little fizzy tonic water it doesn't matter wherever one it is i might get a couple of those in me or something and then just go and just just stand in the middle of the dance and just kind of or you know i might do actually just get like a cheeky sparkling water in me and just literally stand in each corner of the room so go stand at the back top back and back right back left front left front right and then go stand right in the middle and just soak it all up go in the toilet just stand there see everybody over here people going <sighs> yeah in the toilet losing shit right just over here everything just kind of soak it all up hear people kind of arguing in the in the cloak room hear people kind of you know complaining outside in the smoking area girls screaming about where's my phone people asking where their friends are people making new friends in the group or whatever i'm just going to soak it all up just stand in just absorb everything about it um that's hopefully going to be the plan so that's what i'm going to try and do so what best way to do it than just to kind of wait on these shores and hopefully things get to where they need to get to so we can obviously do that very very soon um and then of course the euros has been going on that's been pretty fun to watch um, it's definitely been the euros of the underdogs it feels like all the lesser nations have kind of stepped up and really um you know uh basically put their best foot forward i think i've said it before on social but i think this might be the euros of the pace and passion merchants right the teams that have the much, way more desire are the ones that are gonna maybe end up winning it um because i think the other teams nations especially who have far better players talent wise just kind of give it i think because it's international football it's fair to assume sometimes if your country just has superior talent then mostly more often than not you'll definitely end up winning right because it's international football you can't really you know transfer players it's just the players you have available that are born in your country at that moment in time who are playing so you're kind of limited to who you can pick and sometimes you just might be unlucky where the current crop of the generation of players that you have just aren't that great blah 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 so i think sometimes if you play for a nation that just has an overabundance of talent you sometimes take you can't sometimes can take your foot off the pedal subconsciously without even realizing you sometimes think you know what it's a given if i face this team or this nation that we're just going to win if we just turn up and perform we will win but that's not enough you need to kind of 
you know you need to kind of go into it maybe a little bit more i won't say dare i say professionally but you just need to match the intensity if it feels like of the lesser nations and then hopefully if you match the intensity and you have better players then you know the odds are if those better players get chances to impact the game they should affect the game in a big way um, but then if you don't match the intensity of these lesser nations and their good players end up scoring you can sometimes be you know quickly knocked out as we saw obviously with switzerland beating france um today was a good example of it right france only played well for like what 30 minutes um and then they can or maybe less maybe 20 minutes they played well and then they completely capitulated and you know switzerland just didn't well not capitulate they completely took their fourth to gas and switzerland just kept on attacking and then ended up completely changing the flow of the game and then when it went into the penalties you kind of felt like there's only one winner really um but hey what can you do so it's been a pretty decent i think summer so far like i said um we're still waiting for the clubs to reopen so we can really feel like we're kind of putting covid behind us in some way shape or form you know we can't necessarily put it behind us because people are still getting infected and all that stuff and people unfortunately are still going to die even though we're going to be somewhat out of the woods and back to normal which is going to be a bit of a gnarly feeling right to be in the middle of a dance floor to kind of be enjoying yourself and you know getting into your head of mystic vibes and knowing in the back of your head that there are people still suffering um you know in a really big way and um it's going to be hard to kind of con to contemplate and to sort of rationalize in your head but it's just one of those unfortunate things isn't it we're just going to have to move on one way or the other sooner rather than later we're going to have to because we just can't wait to we can't save everybody and we can't wait until things are perfect it's just one of those kind of weird things which i don't really admire anybody in government if they have to make those sort of decisions because it just comes across a bit callous in it but i guess this is what you kind of go to school for this is what you get in the game for in it so you have to make those big decisions anyway action pack show to get into today loads of loads of interesting things to get into over the weekend that happened so make sure you grab yourself a little drinking all that stuff and we're gonna dive on deep straight away so um there's no probably better way to start <laughs> than what occurred over the last what it feels like a week ago but it was only like a couple of days ago that footage of matt hancock um getting into some sort of you know romantic embrace with one of his assistants in a government building somehow made his way to the sun newspaper and since then his whole life or whole world has been coming crashing down around him now some could say his whole life has come crashing down around him but if the rumors are to be believed that allegedly matt hancock has now decided to shack up with this assistant and they've both decided that they want to lead their partners in favor of each other then maybe this was kind of what he wanted all along right if you're able to find love and you're able to find some sort of kinship with somebody even if you're in a relationship maybe you're going to say it's worth it to do but it doesn't feel like it um especially when you consider the severity of the situation we're going through now with covid this really important part we're at now in our recovery in terms of getting things back up and running and getting things back to some sort of level of normality you would imagine this guy would have a few more things in his kind of you know uh, at the front of his mind as apart from getting his kind of penis wet but hey you got to do what you got to do so this video as i'm playing now leaked to the sun and um when it leaked to the sun you automatically thought i think if i'm not mistaken it was first a screen grab we didn't have a video it was a screen grab and obviously if you know anything about the internet if they've got a screen grab they've got a video footage of it so i was obviously just waiting or most people were just waiting for the footage, the footage to drop and it seemed like it would be kind of perfect time for my hanker to kind of pour a lot of cold water on his story by just resigning as soon as the video dropped and kind of getting on with it right and kind of moving on as soon as possible and letting the, the government bring in a replacement issuing an apology saying that you're going to go and try and fix your family it's a private matter i appreciate people's privacy and it would have kind of got nipped in the bud within 24 hours i think or 48 but because for some reason this video dropped and whoever was advising my hancock decided it was a good idea to kind of just say nothing and then when he didn't make a reply it was like oh this is a personal matter and i'll deal with this privately and he apologized to boris johnson himself and then boris johnson said he accepted it and the matter was closed and you were thinking excuse me how can the how can the matter be closed this is the health secretary completely going against all the protocols and rules that have been put into place primarily by him right this is the thing that makes this even more um 
salacious and much more disappointing and way more infuriating was that Hancock was one of those sticklers for the rules if I'm not mistaken he was one of the people that was kind of you know pushing forward this idea of fining people right during this whole time of lockdown people were being fined in the tens of thousands for breaking COVID restrictions and meeting people outside of their bubble and all this sort of stuff and here he is doing the complete opposite of what he's telling other people to do and you'd imagine and given the level of his because i think if this was somebody maybe a little bit more lower in the government or maybe less of a profile he could probably he or she could probably ride it out more right maybe but considering how high profile he is considering as well that it does feel like there's been a concentrated effort behind the scenes with people like dominic cummins and a few other people to kind of paint Matt hancock out as being a bit of a dummy being a bit of a deuce of what they called him they said he was useless right and who knows he might be useless but there was definitely some it felt like a co it felt like a is it coerced or constructive whatever there was definitely something it felt like there was like a coordinated attack going on behind him um behind the scenes and you would just imagine somebody a little bit more experienced and positive would have been like you know what they smell blood in the water and i know there's probably something coming right because it's usually when stuff like this happens and they're sort of conduct concocting stories leaking certain things it usually feels like they're kind of trying to put pressure on you so you can jump before you get pushed and just considering the severity and him knowing that he's got this in the back of his head knowing that he's done this behind the scenes he should have just got, you know resigned on the spot but then maybe that also goes to show that maybe behind the scenes there's a lot of there's people are doing a lot of maybe yeah maybe this goes to show that behind the scenes in the government there are other people who are doing far worse things than what my Hancock are doing and they're getting away with it so maybe he thought he could get away with it too so that goes to show that you know this government is just like oh, useless beyond the what useless is probably a um kind way to describe them overall it's just incredible how crappy they've dealt with everything it's just maddening so this is it goes to the government go the guardian sorry it says matt hancock resigns as health secretary after a day of humiliation Matt Hancock has resigned obviously he did a little press conference video there he said Matt Hancock resigned as health secretary after the tory mps ministers and grassroots conservatives defied Boris Johnson's demand to be dismissed from the government the ministers fell on his word after a day that began with the senior tories observing deliberate silence over a um, hancock's future seemingly to test public opinion in their constitutions before many later broke ranks and this that's definitely the more disappointing side of it I I would much rather people just come out and just say i think there were a couple of mps who had a bit more backbone or like you know what um it's a personal matter it doesn't affect how he does his work whether he gets up to behind private doors or you know in his private life and just let him get on with the job now don't get me wrong i think it's disgusting obviously he should fall on his sword regardless but i much prefer that straight up honesty coming out of people rather than this sort of like you know silence and waiting to see which way the wind blows and then trying to step out and make a statement that goes to show how spineless some of these people are and they continue to say it's understood that hancock had been considering resigning since friday after his apology for kissing his closest aide gina colandiangelo um in his ministerial office in breach of his co own covid19 rules failed to quell public outrage the resignation is a massive blow to the authority of the prime minister who has stood by the 42 year old following his apology declaring the matter to be closed so that's usually the that's honestly one of the most egregious parts of it but it's also had a rare chance again to somehow come out of this looking good right even though you have to say this sort of level of insubordination within his own kind of constituency or within people obviously within his own government just maybe shows the overall lack of control he has with people the lack of fear they have in the position that they hold everyone just kind of feels that like they can do whatever they want with no real repercussions which you know has been sort of proven he could have a rare chance to kind of paint himself out to be like the you know laying the law down and you know um uh, making sure that he kind of dismisses this idea that everyone has where it's one rule for us and one rule for everybody else he could have done that and stepped out and said you know what you're fired and he still didn't do it right and supposedly now he's coming out and trying to say oh yeah i did fire him all this sort of stuff it's just like no you didn't mate you really didn't um in his recognition letter my hancock said we have worked so hard to the country to fight the pandemic the last thing i'd want is for my private life to distract um attention from the single-minded focus that is leading us out of this crisis i want to reiterate my apology for breaking the guidance and apologize to my my family and loved ones for putting them through this i also need to be with my children at this time no mention of his wife because allegedly again like i said he's gonna hook up with this gina woman which you know do your thing it is what it is but just imagine the humiliation for the wife in it just imagine because i don't get me wrong most of these mps are probably not the greatest of husbands but i would imagine there is some sort of 
complicit agreement right this sort of like dirty deal you do with the devil where you sort of are okay with your husband maybe having some extra marital relations as long as he just doesn't bring you home and embarrass you right that's the least of your issues you'd imagine and for the most part mps are kind of good at sort of keeping their more you know salacious stories about them out of the press whether it's they paying people off allegedly i don't know or whether it's just because they just do things behind closed doors they're fairly careful about how they you know navigate the streets of london and the streets of the uk but this is just yeah this is just maddening but then again who filmed the video that's what i want to know i want to know how did this cctv camera get into a government building that's able to kind of monitor and view one of you know the government's top aides in such a precarious position like how was this possible and if i'm not mistaken if they saw what did i see i think i saw a picture of the office itself and if the camera did look fairly obvious it was one of those massive sort of like bulby ones um that you might see in the sort of supermarket somewhere so it's kind of you maybe think it's a bit dumb that he would do something like this right in the line of sight of a camera but then again what other stuff goes on in that room that we haven't seen yet on that footage maybe he's the most high profile person to get there but i just think there needs to be a bit more of an investigation understanding as to why this footage even got out in the first place for sure that someone definitely had it in for him for sure he probably pissed off the wrong people behind the scenes but there definitely is a lot more to the story that we're probably not privy to and we probably never will be um johnson said he's to reply that he was sorry to lose hancock and that he should leave office very proud for what he achieved yeah of course you should not just attacking the pandemic but even before covid 19 struck i said i'm grateful for your support and i believe that your contribution to public service is far from over and yes it is over um labor um, leader Keir Stamer said hancock was right to resign but boris johnson should have sacked him last night sergey javid a former chancellor and home secretary was announced by Daniel Shea's replacement Gajavid quit a chancellor in February last year. The Prime Minister had ordered him to fire his closest aide and replace him with advisors chosen by number 10 if one to remain in the post. And then again, to make matters even worse, right, then we have this article, courtesy of the BBC, which says, Mahan Congress Nation, Boris Johnson defends his actions. And you just, if you, if you ever thought these people could be more unscrupulous, this is definitely another example. It's just, you know, why I try not to care about politics whatsoever because these people are just horrendous. So Boris Johnson has defended his actions following Hancock's resignation. Asked why he hadn't sacked Hancock, Mr. Johnson replied, I read the story on Friday and by Saturday we had a new health secretary. The Prime Minister says the resignation happened at the right pace. So he's trying to basically say that he inadvertently played a role in my Hancock um, sort of resigning when he knows especially in politics or even big corporations, part of the reason why you fire somebody on the spot for stuff like this is mostly to send a message to the rest of your troops that rules apply to everybody. We're all on the same level playing field. If we're not all pulling in the same direction, this is what can happen to you. So that it reinstates that sense of um, authority that you have, because of course, insubordination could lead people to think that, oh, management haven't really got a control or a grip on what's going on in the company um, or people's authority isn't respected. So you kind of fire somebody on the spot to kind of reassess assert that and to send a message subliminally but also to kind of reassert your position right in yourself like to kind of let people know under no certain terms who's the boss and he didn't do that and you don't need to wait two days or three days you can just do it on the same day the story comes out because they had all the information um, i'm sure they could have got some info from government aides and people be you know with their ear to the ground they could have told them hey there's a video supposedly the sun has more stuff coming out about hancock there's loads of things that they kind of put i think they put out no a picture or a clip of hancock and his gina woman having a dinner at some restaurant you know recently too um there was supposedly footage has taken place of them doing the same kissing thing behind the door like a week ago too so i'm sure they could have they would have known the severity of the situation and he could have made the decision straight away but this is just honestly these people man they're horrible um the prime minister says he's very nation at the right page he said however number 10 said the pm had accepted the apology for mr Cam mr hancock and considered them at a close um so yeah, um, asks why the Prime Minister declared the matter closed on Friday, but then thought Hancock was a right to resign. The spokesperson said they had further discussions on Saturday. The Prime Minister thought it was a right decision. However, <laughs> Labour's leader, honestly, these people, but he thought it was the right decision, true, but he didn't take the decision himself. And this definitely goes to show, I remember, I forgot who it was, this old guy came out ages ago and basically said that one of Boris's like kind of worst traits is the fact that he never makes a decision. He just waits to see what everyone else feels and then he would just go with whatever is popular at the time which is obviously something that you don't want as a leader right you want someone just to be decisive even if it's the wrong sort of decisiveness you want them to make a decision at, you know at least 
you want to make some sort of decision quickly, right? Whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, just make some decision so we know how to react and we know, you know, which way to pressure, to push you. This whole, like, kind of woman and r stuff is probably why we're in the situation that we're in now with COVID. But, hey, what can you do? And, again, you know, how it ended up, um, how anybody can find Matt Hancock, you know, sexually appealing in that way, is no, it, no one knows. But I think it always goes to show why I think most guys, for the most part, don't really worry about trying to get good okay yeah i don't think that's why most single guys for the most part don't worry about trying to have game because i think deep down all men know i think as per you know futures lyric that you know um she's um if you've got money she's you always her type that's basically partly true especially success or especially kind of notoriety you know um notoriety is the right way what's the what's the word um fame power all that stuff right it's the same sort of conversation or same category as money I think deep down most men know intrinsically if they get some level of success, some level of fame in any area of expertise that they're in, even if it's flipping playing chess or, you know, it's flipping frisbee, whatever it is that they do very well, if they can get some level of notoriety or fame from that area, they know they're going to have a whole queue of genius kind of, you know, trying to have a cheeky snob behind a barn door somewhere. It's always going to happen, unfortunately. And it obviously goes to show as well, um, you know, um, unfortunately for as much as women like to talk about how much, you know, how important it is to, or for as much as some people, women on social media anyway, for the most part, like to talk about the looks of certain dudes and how they wouldn't give this guy the time of day because he's ugly and all this sort of stuff. At the end of the day, it's not really about what you look like because, you know, Hancock is not the most um you know he's not a, you wouldn't describe him as a stud would you really and here he is um having the pick of the litter he's got a wife at home that clearly well for the most part of what we heard so far is clearly still in love with him but he decided to ditch her for this new one who's willing to leave her husband to go to him it's just yeah the success power money all that stuff definitely goes a long way into kind of heightening or widening your appeal to the opposite sex if you're a dude so if you're worried about your game and you you know you're not you're not kind of confident you're going to get any better at it or you're a kind of severe introvert with no ability to communicate with people especially strangers just try to be successful it's really difficult to do don't get me wrong probably way harder to try and be successful than it is to just try and get good at game yeah and have the ability to have the gift of the gab but if you don't want to you don't need to matt hancock proved it man you really really don't need to but yeah that's that one next on the list what else do we have here what's this important yes move this one um it was the spring summer 2020 shows i think yeah over the last couple of weeks over the last week or so in paris everybody's out doing their best bit you know getting stunt uh, stunning in front of camera wearing all their best garbs and all that malarkey chin stroking you know bizu bizu kiss kiss and virgil debuted obviously his spring summer collection show too and in that he revealed yet another nike collaboration right it seems like um nike have decided to kind of place all their bets on the va train they basically think like you know the way he works and the output that he's um, you know able to churn out is probably perfect for what nike want to do i think if there's one thing that we realize over nike about the last few years is that they're definitely more of a maximalist brand right they want the most possible shoes out there at the most possible time right they want as many shoes as possible to be out there in the market they don't care about you know flooding the market oversaturating it as many shoes as they can get out there the better there's no you know there's probably too many um rabid sneakers out there willing to pay above and beyond or go above and beyond to get those shoes so they know that there's you know the demand is super high um so if they are able to get the right shoe out at the right price range with the right amount of kind of marketing and hype behind it it's going to be a hit it's going to be a hit and and of course, which better way to kind of solidify a hit than getting Virgil Abloh to do another Nike collaboration? And this time, it's on the Nike Air Force One silhouette. Um, it looks like he's doing an entire collection of Nike Air Force Ones. It doesn't, not really sure what the idea behind it is. If it's going to be some sort of anniversary tie-in, I'm not really sure. But it definitely did pick up some hype or some attention over the interwebs the other day. And I think when I initially saw them on the runway. I wasn't that really sold on them, especially just sort of all over print. 
you've got here and i'm sure um nike are going to try and convince us that they use the same fabric that they use on the louis vuitton bags on these shoes which i'm going to say with some sort of level of um, certainty that it's definitely going to be a lie they're definitely going to use a version of the leather they use on the bags but it's not going to be the same one i just can't see it happening unless the shoes are going to retail for like a thousand pounds or something which i don't see happening either but regardless um i wasn't really fond of the shoes and i saw them on a the runway but then now in terms of product shots um on their own they do look really really good of course they kind of harken back to the good old days of um dapper dan right and now who's kind of got his own little atelier that he had does with gucci and this kind of early 2000s era in hip-hop where people were sort of like cutting bits of fabric bits of kind of gucci and louis vuitton fabric from bags or trousers or whatever vintage items they could get and then kind of slowly but surely in my case when i did it when i was in school um or when i used to buy them maybe sometimes from meteor sports is that they'd either be stitched on or super glued on but usually it's the same sort of kind of idea i think wiley was famous for wearing a few of those sort of pairs and you know especially on an all-white sneaker with like that sort of um kind of um gucci or leather or louis vuitton print pasted over the swoosh it just looked impeccable sometimes you get it on the front of the sort of toe box area but usually those two areas are the ones so that's great to see with this sort of mid colorway here that i've got at the moment on the screen it does kind of remind me a little bit of what um Comme des Garçons did with their Air Force One with this sort of like extra sort of material um hanging off loose i'm not sure if that's because it's a sample or whatnot then you've got the double tongue which again is maybe a little bit similar to what um sakai have done with their nike so maybe this is partly a tie-in model i'm not too sure if this is going to be a unique thing but then if you look closely it does look like they've purposely kind of make them look like they're two shoes mashed into one you've got the kind of the you got a sock bit here of a mid kind of stuck into a air force one low so i'm to show if this is something that they've kind of cut up themselves in the studio and then made and then kind of put in there like as a styling thing you know obviously because he's you've got ib kamara working with him now at louis vuitton so maybe this is something that they've kind of done as a styling sort of nod i'm not really too sure on that one but the mids look really 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 good that's definitely something that we, i can say with some level of certainty there's i think supposedly 21 different colorways due to come out again if you listen to the recent um what interview was it before i think it might be an interview that he posted virgil on his kind of instagram um talking about i think it was kind of like a, a, a uh, an audible version of show notes which is pretty decent i think he spoke to the, one of the guys who designed some of the artwork on the invitations or something i'm not too sure um but regardless i think he mentioned in that interview that how he doesn't have any issue with putting out more models he thinks the whole idea behind the more premise is that you know um he kind of likes the idea that like you have these classic silhouettes in loads of different colorways and that can kind of inform how you decide to wear certain bits of clothing and it's basically the same adage that what gucci main followed right i remember it was a long time when people used to complain about gucci main putting out too many mixtapes and um and whatnot and I remember him saying something like, no, um, I don't cater to people that who think like that. I'm catering to my fans. And I know my fans always want to hear from me. So I'm going to put out as much material as possible for my fans. And if, any, if people think it's too much, don't listen to it. But I know my fans will love it. And I think that's what he kind of does as well virgil with his nike collaborations he knows there is a segment of the population out there that want to have every single one because i'm sure there's definitely going to be some sneakerheads who will kind of make it their mission to own every single pair in the collection or as many as they can the same they did with the tens and the dunks and whatnot so why not cater to them and if you happen to you know get some stragglers along along the way some general public normie kind of people then that's a benefit but um yeah 21 different colorways um kind of you know classic air force one sort of mock-ups to um color blocking bits and bobs here and there um it looks like the entire uppers are definitely going to be inspired by that louis vuitton fabric if not they're gonna again try and convince us that these levers have been somehow plucked from the bags that they use i'm not really a fan of the air, air here on the back of the air force on sorry on the midsole but you know it is what it is that's sort of like his um virgil's trademark i did see on one of the mids that they had on the instep they had the sort of like off-white beaverton stamp thing so I'm not too sure if officially on the books it's going to read Nike Louis Vuitton Off-White because that looks like one of his kind of signatures, right? That kind of stamp there. I'm not too sure, but we'll continue. Again, you've got a uh, white and yellow colorway here. You've got purple or lilac and white colorway there too. You've got a sort of celtic -y kind of colorway. You've got this colorway here that looks specific, kind of oddly enough, creepily similar to a Marvel Bapeser that came out 
ages ago i think it might be uh wolverine or something like that it was kind of similar to that sort of colorway let me see if i can actually get it up here um was it bape uh marvel shoes oh it's not hulk but it's definitely that colorway let me see shoes or oh, the whole colorway is really nice isn't it? i think it was a wolverine i'm not too sure which colorway it is but that looks similar to that one okay there it is i've got it here so that one does look fairly similar to um which one is it it's that one right isn't it yeah x-men so it's the marvel and x-men one so that colorway does look eerily similar to this let me see if i can get up on the screen for you bear with me okay we've got it back up there on the screen so it does look so oh, that's the wrong one it does look similar to this there it is that one there see that and that is on the cyclops that cyclops one does look very similar to um what virgil did at louis vuitton with this sort of colorway right there's some sort of similarity there between the two i would imagine but yeah um pretty decent colorways all, all in i think that might be the last tense one i see a couple of more which one they've got here you've got another one too that looks eerily like um is it a jp version that's got that toe I forgot it went maybe it's a code jp it's nephil's one it's got like a silver toe with like a blocked with like a more darker sort of colorways that goes towards the back of the man card i forgot which one it is but regardless anyway it does look fairly similar and you've got this called classic code code jp sort of colorway as well with the all white upper and the kind of solid black sole that you saw a bit used with the uh matthew williams um air force one that he did as well it would be, is that at least air force one the, the, the highs they did a few couple of years ago i think it might have been and of course you've got this nice little silver swoosh day coming through so um again no date sale um yet so far we don't really know all this text here from hype beast says blah 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 is there a date we don't really have a date so far to know when these shoes are going to come out but you know one thing we're going to know for certain we're all going to get l's we're going to catch hella l's out here so that's definitely something to keep in mind i'm interested to see how they roll them out which stores get them what's the sort of materials and release info going to be attached to them it feels like there's a lot of shoes coming out with virgil back to back so i wonder what they're going to do with the scheduling are they gonna they're gonna they have to drop these um 50 dunks right that he's doing and then what how soon after are these going to come out right it's a lot of shoes isn't it that's why sometimes i think it makes me chuckle when you hear people from nike talk about sustainability and environment all that sort of stuff right they are churning out so much trash right so much kind of um not trash so much clothes so many items so many things out there have been pushed out back to back to back and again that's not considering all the other stuff that they have that we don't know about um and talk about something that we don't know about commend um virgil too very very commendable that he was somehow able to keep all this under wraps that's something that you can definitely say it was definitely something that was kind of um weird considering how things leak so quickly especially with the chinese factories and whatnot it feels like um those rep factories always get some exclusive sneak peeks into models that we don't even know about before they've even been announced so for him to do this entire project and we have absolutely no idea it's coming is definitely commendable um definitely goes to show that he definitely has some good friends up there at nike they were able to kind of keep their mouth stum, or maybe they were kind of worried about the backlash maybe that's why yeah maybe we have to kind of look at it differently maybe the these leaks aren't exactly leaks in a conventional sense they're more so the brands themselves deciding what they want people to know and they purposely put stuff out for you know to kind of gauge the public sentiment similar to what the government here in the uk are doing with covid where they kind of decide you know which way the wind blows based on how people react to some things that they kind of conveniently leak out there maybe that's part of it but i know when i initially saw the pictures on the runway i wasn't a fan of the shoes and then as soon as i saw virgil post these on his instagram account from the top down they just looked great straight away you know what i mean and it does go to show how important it is like how much photography plays into sometimes sneakers especially how you connect with certain shoes I don't know what it is about them, but it's definitely something, you know, the contrast with the carpet, with these kind of severely flared, tailored pants, the laces all loosened up. But that definitely adds to the overall um, 
appeal of a shoe it definitely helps it to kind of elevate it this whole different way i don't know what exactly but definitely does um do it for me in that sense so that was definitely something and then i think when he when he then wore the tailored suit thing that definitely again added to the overall appeal and kind of made people think you know what this shoe is definitely the one and you know as we know with most hype shoes whatever shoes being worn by the model or being worn by the brand owner that's kind of collaborating with the shoe mostly like day on a daily basis is definitely the one that's going to sell out so for sure if you're looking to get a pair um that kind of classic jacket sort of that kind of classic yeah louis vuitton bag color with the sort of uh the dark kind of colorways and the light colorways on the on the shoe is definitely going to be the one that ends up selling out the first so definitely kind of keep your eyes peeled out for them when they end up dropping but again great job from virgil he's shown and proving that he might be the number one collaborator out there at nike in terms of putting things together that people just consistently want you know sakai do a good job of doing that as well but on the scale that virgil's doing it and at the you know the frequency he's doing at the moment and the kind of quantity it seems as if everything he puts out people seem to kind of have a weird reaction to it there's another yeah this is a really or a strong reaction to it either way which definitely goes to show um it's definitely an inkling of what great design is isn't it right having either a really strong positive or negative feeling against anything is definitely a marker of your you doing something right i think when you do something and it's a kind of milk toast response is when definitely you should be worried and look at this this all white colorway is just lush in it again i'm not too sure if the leather is going to be exactly the same as the bags but the leather does look good that's one thing you could definitely say um without any sort of um indignation that leather does look good and he says here and his caption for the record in my mind therefore um reality in my mind therefore reality these are our objects with a capital a just as much as they are simply shoes once i find the right plinth in the right institution the idea is complete the quality of the materials and the methodology to make these is apparent from the casual iphone pick it would be it would take me a netflix series to properly break down the whole logic and process but i'm beyond honored to bring my architecture a division at nike focused on bringing inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world and my louis vuitton team focused desirability through the world's best craftsmanship artistic integrity and storytelling and of course siri play, play dear summer when i said that i meant this so yeah he's definitely going for blood this feels like he definitely want to remind you guys that that first nike 10 collaboration wasn't a fluke i can do it again and again and again regardless of what silhouette or kind of uh shape or shoe you give me maybe there is something to be said for people thinking you know what maybe he's kind of um playing it safe and just going for the kind of killer models that people that he knows people are going to generally like i would argue against it but some people would say that he maybe needs to take it to the next level and maybe design his own model with the help of nike that maybe go to show if he's definitely got the juice or not that definitely kind of is something that probably separates what virgil's doing with nike than what you kind of did when he's at his time there of course he tests himself a bit more by making completely new silhouettes but in terms of just delivering on the canvases they have available virgil might be one of the top out there so congrats to him on that shoe when it drops it drops again most people are going to get l's anyway so there's no point even worrying about it too tough <laughs> but it is what it is we move next on the list we have um travis scott actually debuted a little capsule collection that he was doing with dior it feels like um kim jones is again one of those sort of like you know great dudes and the idea that he kind of helps or wants to collaborate with many people as possible to kind of get his show up and running and get it to a level it needs to be you think of the help that he kind of helped you know the kind of the uh, yeah the, the platform he gave to somebody like a matthew williams when you probably didn't need to do it when you'd imagine some people would think of Matthew Williams maybe being his competition in that sort of menswear field um, but he still was able to kind of look past that and give his platform to him and allow him to make some of the early sort of fixtures and buckles and stuff for some of his saddlebags and help design that stuff and now he's doing the same thing with Travis like you know Kim Jones is definitely a top dude so this is a first look at Travis Scott's Dior footwear collection again heavily inspired by some of the what would you say early 2000s skateboarding shoes um you know you've got that really low profile shoe with the really wide base kind of thick of sole uh puffy tongue something that you kind of associate with that lam lambin skate shoe that came out recently but you definitely see where the trend is sort of pointing towards right this sort of kind of early 2000s late 90s sort of like skateboarding aesthetic is definitely in vogue and 
of course travis wanted to lend his design credences to it now i'm not sure if this was designed specifically with travis scott from the bottom up or if it's a model that dior did and as most brands do they will just enlist the assistance of a very famous brand or co you know influencer to kind of launch it and then obviously it's rated out in kind of regular colors as it goes along but regardless man the shoe itself is pretty nice as an original sort of like shape um you got this is that 3m piping here honestly i'm not too sure it's got the kind of dior um cactus track logo there on the back tab so maybe it goes to show that it's a pacific model put into play specifically for travis this sort of neon pop on the lining of this shoe is lovely if you're not seeing this shoe it's basically a kind of mustard brown it feels like um new buck upper with some white bits and pieces and then on the lining of the shoe it's got a real bright bright neon pop on the inside like you don't really see that too tough on a lining that looks beautiful really really nice and then you've got this kind of nice sky blue colorway here is that denim was that kind of cordray mesh not too sure is that free and piping probably not but it would be great if it was nice fat laces as well they're gonna probably churn out as many colors as possible in these because you know the shape makes it easy i mean the shape and the paneling makes it easier to kind of rustle up some fairly decent colorways i like the addition of these little cd eyelets here at the top for to represent christian dior they look pretty sick i like them man really really good model and you've got obviously the christian dior classic jack logo on the back hill tab you've got this little emblem here on the hill that looks slightly off centered it looks like to me maybe because it's a sample shoe for the run well, i'm not too sure but it does look a little bit slightly off centered but regardless really really well done travis and kim jones uh for dior collaboration there do we have a date set out for that not really but again nice to see nice to see moving on what else do we have here we've got the collection we can skip that no real point in talking about that we know our guan oh this is quite cool isn't it again this is courtesy of hype beast just on first inline sneaker the courtside hides inspired by michael jordan michael jordan sorry ferrari testarossa 512 tr um obviously you're familiar with just on he was obviously one of kanye's right hand men during the early sort of like period of the jordan era retro era time when they were all hanging out him virgil um what's his fucking name again the hairdresser guy a lot of them anyway right the original crew they hang out with them kanye and again kanye's influence is strong in, in the ability to kind of cultivate a group of people around him like-minded who then go on to do their own thing and they're all killing it individually of course um and just don obviously has his own sort of like snapback collection that he obviously made popular with the whole like leather python straps and um what do you call it is it beak visor the front of the, of the hat where regardless you know what i mean right he kind of started off that trend and now there's many a brands have kind of come in and copied him um i actually owned one of those hats i sold one don't know which one i had i forgot which team it was that really matter but hey um he does really good with all that sort of basketball inspired stuff again it's a, it's very much basketball inspired um you know luxury items and unless you kind of like that look it can be somewhat you know marmite but um these shoes i gotta be honest critic him again maybe it's not for me to wear day to day and it might not specifically go with a lot of stuff in my wardrobe but just in terms of design they look fantastic like legitimately fantastic like everything that you would hope to see from a designer shoe right because that's what it is it's kind of like a luxury designer shoe you see it next to a hermes birkin bag there it looks so great it's taking all the elements of some of you know um the more legendary shoes within nike sort of archives and sort of kind of giving it an updated fashion tint you know this exaggerated thicker sole here you've got this great toe box you've got this really great low prof kind of flat profile again none of that annoying um banana foot thing that <coughs> nike has going on with a lot of their retros look at the massive sort of um rubber labeling here on the on the tongue great eyelids like just it just looks solid as hell in it the laces are nice and thick they can be tied pretty they can be i guess tied one way or kind of left really loose as well and they'll still look pretty good like this white colorway is the one but that black and bread sort of colorway i think i'm not sure if that's so it's translucent it does look translucent but this sort of black red colorway is just come on man 
this is so good it don't get me wrong it does have a little bit of a fear of god vibe towards it but as just an original sneaker in terms of what it looks like like these are incredibly good like incredibly good and they actually look of real high quality they look like they've been you know when people say made in italy these look like they've been made in italy um and look how they're going to be well worth whatever retail price he puts on them in the end but these are really really good um of course i'd hide look at that shape look at the shape i go on about this a lot mostly because again if you look at some of the older nike models especially some of the vintage ones um you know just let's just take a jordan 4 one of my kind of top shoes or one of my top five shoes of all time you look at an, an actual jordan one that came out in the 90s or whatever when it did originally come out is it 90s or 87 whenever it originally come out you'll see that the profile of the shoe is a lot more aggressive and flat than the sort of retros when they initially then ended up retroing them again the back sort of like hill portion kind of sank down a bit some of the panels got a bit skewed the toe boxes had that weird banana thing they just messed up they messed it up and for some reason whenever you complained about this sort of stuff you'd always hear back that you know to replace the tooling and to get the last the original kind of mold or to remake the mold it'll just it costs like somewhere within the you know half a million dollars to get that redone whatever it is right the price is usually above 10 grand to get that sort of last done and that's the excuse they generally have in terms of why they're not going to do it but you think to yourself surely if nike decided to just make a retro of a jordan 4 a jordan 1 all right whatever the successful ones are or the most popular ones are sorry jordan sixes sevens and decide to make them to spec all right to spec like you see the ones that people are wearing now and getting them resold to spec of the ogs like a jordan 1 85 gray that everyone was flipping going you know crazy over you get those you make them to spec to how they originally came out you give them a distressing on the sole midsole whatever it may be you could easily charge people two times three times the retail price and they'd gladly buy them gladly especially because you have to think most of the shoes you're definitely marketing them to wall sneakerheads so why not just make what make it the way that they want it to be made instead of doing all this other hullabalooza i never really understood why that was actually a thing but you know the good thing about it nowadays is that um these other individuals can come in and now with obviously collaborating with certain factories or maybe getting certain deals i don't know or just investing money into it, it doesn't matter that they're able to go and do this sort of thing now because i think a few years ago this would have been a little bit more impossible or maybe now with the internet um, if as long as you got the money and the kind of time and the knowledge and the know-how you can basically make your own shoe from the ground up and you can if you want um, give these other brands a run for their money especially in that space that niche space where you're kind of you know specifically selling to a particular customer who doesn't mind spending you know more than 200 300 pound a sneaker because they're already they're already buying luxury designer shoes from you know you know storied fashion houses why not go to an actual person like a don c who's got an actual history within the sneaker community game knows everything there is to know about trainers spend the whole time buying them himself you know had his own shop had his own brand all this sort of stuff he's definitely going to give you a far better um iteration or example or version of his own take on a classic shoe than you would get from like a you know saint laurent for instance right they're going to give you a sort of bastardized um ch shitty sort of fashion version of a shoe but he's definitely going to give you the sneaker side of it and also the more luxury fashion side of it as well like these are a perfect amalgamation of this I'm not too sure if that tongue is slightly inspired by an harachi is that me or is am i bugging out this little strip there on the front of it. it looks like a little bit of an harachi inspired tongue inspired there but regardless man these these flipping course side highs are absolutely gorgeous i'm a big fan of these um i think they came out on the 25th if i'm not mistaken i'm not too sure what the price is but i'm sure it's not going to be cheap but still regardless of what the price is um the shoe is sick the um, colorways are definitely going to be amazing when they ended up dropping more over the next few current seasons i'm assuming it's going to be an easy seller for him it's definitely going to make this guy a multi-millionaire that's definitely for sure if he isn't already that's definitely a nice clear soul isn't it yeah that definitely looks like it but yeah big up don c um just on uh court side highs they look incredible i'm a big fan of them um and yeah if you got yourself a pair count yourself lucky what else we got here let's move on oh yeah let's talk about this this is courtesy of football 365 and of course you know talking about some of the main talking points from the euros it says here is paul Pogba better than bruno fernandez and um interesting conversation because 
this is this is partly one of the dumbest reasons why I got banned from a particular, you know, top red United forum, specifically called the United Forum, because of my um, questioning of the you know collective narrative that a lot of top red United fans who are generally kind of abiding by about questioning too much. And don't get me wrong, there is some sort of I understand the sentiment around some of the people who are kind of not really sold on Paul Pogba. I think even some of his staunchest fans can not deny that he hasn't necessarily been a you know, uh, resounding success at United on a consistent basis. He's had some good moments. He's had some good periods. But overall, season in, season out, he's probably flat to deceive, especially considering how good he played or how well he played at Juventus during that kind of couple of sp- two seasons, three seasons, wherever it was, right? He definitely, you saw maybe his best um, football in a club shirt um, for a very, very long time. And then, it was no surprise when Bruno Fernandes was signed to United and he hit the ground running and he was influencing games, providing assists, scoring big decisive goals, whether they were penalties or free kicks, you still have to put them in the back of the net. Um, it made people kind of think, if this guy could do it, who clearly maybe isn't as good technically or has the God-given gifts that Pogba has, then there's just no excuse and we have to kind of look at Pogba with a bit more scrutiny. But then there was a weird faction of the fan base too that kind of made it known that, oh, this is what we need at a team going forward. We need more Bruno Fernandes and less more of a Pogba's. And that's where I kind of had to kind of jump off and say, no, the actual problem is that for the most part of Pogba's career at United, he's had to play with crappy players. And in the moment, a good player or a decent enough player comes in alongside him and plays in the team and takes the weight of expectation off of him a little bit and allows him to kind of play his own game and know that he did nothing or it doesn't always just rest on him in the midfield it's no surprise that we saw some of his best football too right and then sorry but surely because I kind of got the feeling when they first started I think Bruno Fernandes was maybe you know buying into the gas a little bit more and maybe asserting himself as the kind of heir to the throne of Pogba but then I think over time they maybe develop a bit more of a friendship and you could definitely saw that they kind of enjoyed playing with each other because they clearly knew deep down that they were probably two of the better midfield players that we have in our club overall so if they want the team to be successful and they want to win trophies and they have to kind of make sure that they have some level of um you know uh compatibility when they're on the pitch and they have some sort of level of understanding and ever since then they feel like they've kind of generally got closer and closer um as friends and as teammates but there's no denying that you know in terms of god-given gifts and talents and the ability to play in different positions Pogba is a far better player um some would even argue myself included that he can sometimes i think probably play as a number 10 far better than bruno fernandez can play as a number 10 and i think the problem with bruno fernandez is his stats and his numbers are just so freakishly good especially when he first arrived at united it made you kind of think that he was a far better player than what his actual skill set is and i think that's what made me really get confused when all these top reds would argue with you and would maybe compare bruno fernandez to a flipping eric Cantona I just never understood how that made any sense like he's nothing like Eric Cantona he's not as good as Eric Cantona technically as a football player and obviously as a you know as a born winner and you know the and the ability to kind of take us from you know zero to heroes and champions and stuff he hasn't necessarily won anything at the club either so um giving them that kind of moniker for that impact that he had in the club was very short-sighted and I just think fundamentally as a number 10 he's not doing himself favors because he quite clearly in my opinion isn't a number 10 he's maybe a combative box-to-box number eight in a really good midfield three right i think he could play as a number eight really well like for instance if they had we had a a very prof, a very kind of proficient and effective and good dynamic defensive midfield player who pro, whose kind of main prerogative was to defend and we allowed Pogba and Bruno to kind of play in front of them I think you'd see the best in Bruno in that regard but where he plays now at May United where he essentially plays as a second striker doesn't necessarily bring out the best in him either because he's not technically good enough to hold on to the ball um, to dribble past players to feed balls through um, to just have that little bit of ingenuity and skill that's not what he does but when in terms of kind of playing first team first touch yeah first part or first touch yeah first touch balls over the top um kind of what people would relate to spamming crosses in the box i think he's definitely got a skill there but i think as most modern day football players nowadays 
um, we overrate some and underrate others. I think, you know, in, in the world of football now, you're not allowed to kind of compare or people kind of look at you weirdly if you try and compare Jordan Henson with anybody because they just say Jordan Henson's a donkey. But then I also think he has these attributes that could obviously work well into particular systems, but you don't necessarily say just because Jordan Henson plays well for one season that suddenly he is a far better football player than the Paul Popper. That's not how it goes. But again, the people that then say Paul Popper walks on water are obviously smoking complete crack. So there's definitely a lack of perspective and sort of like, um, objectivity when it comes to judging players which has always kind of puzzled me as well maybe it's a modern era thing but when I was growing up watching football there was not this kind of and again you have to imagine the kind of football players that we had like Ronaldinho you know Rivaldo even before that Fat Ronaldo before that like some Zidane some really like freakishly good individual players there wasn't that kind of fervent love maybe because of lack of social media where people will just be fans of players first as opposed to teams mostly we just you know we're fans of the team first and if your team your team had to happen to have a really good player fair enough but you wouldn't just you know um put away any kind of critical thinking to one side just because your player didn't score or did score or didn't play well or did play well like it didn't go like that so this is this whole weird new era where now it's very bizarre but anyway the article says the following the curious case of pop up and brilliant fans it says has there ever been a case of two supposedly world class players playing the polar opposite to Pogba and Bruno Fernandes in respective to when they pull on their shirt from Man United in their respective national teams? Fernandes talked about as one of the most impactful signings of the decade, is the most important player in the team, was in the Premier League team of the season and won four Premier League Player of the Month awards in his short spell at the club. For Portugal, he was poor for two games at the Euros and hence dropped to the bench when he had came on last night against Belgium again, looked really poor. But any um, any kind of objective United fan would have told you that Bruno Fernandes was never going to play the same way that he does for United for Portugal because he doesn't play that well for, for United. Sometimes he'll play really badly, but then we'll end up getting a penalty or a spot or like a really good or like a free kick and you end up putting in a good cross into the box, scoring directly from a free kick or being able to kind of bury a penalty. And again, these things aren't easy. They're not kind of foregone conclusions, but they do go a long way. They do kind of somehow distract from his game, same way that Rashford. Rashford has a sense of doing that too where Rashford would have a clutch moment where he would kind of pick up the ball from the right hand side or left hand side cut in and bang the ball into the bottom corner but that doesn't take away from his complete stinker of a performance for the majority of the match but again if you don't watch United you just kind of pay attention to the stats or whatnot you would just think that for some reason Brevendis plays at an 8 out of 10 every week and that's not the truth and when he's asked to play as a midfielder again because I think he's kind of built up bad habits at United because Oli just lets him do what he wants he's obviously going to play poorly when then he's put into a team or a midfield that really needs him to look after the ball to distribute it better and to just not be wasteful in possession and that's one thing that he does a lot at United he's very wasteful he kind of you know just tries to spam as many passes and balls as possible to kind of force things and sometimes it pays or something it doesn't but in international football you just can't afford to kind of um, give a possession on that sort of like frequency and also try and win games it's just not going to happen and it continues here it says Paul Popper on every hand has been played by inconsistencies and criticism from virtually everyone who has spent time watching Man United over the last years it would probably be unfair to call him a flop however he is a player over 30 he's a he's sorry however he has played over 30 Premier League games in one of his five six decisions um, and uh, although I'm sure injuries have impacted a lot of the time it was simply not being good in going for the pitch now compare this to France where he was one of the key players winning the World Cup in 2018 and so far this tournament looks sensational although France is blessed with one of the greatest collection of players in generation Pogba stands out and excels and that's a great example because with the Pogba situation like people need to understand but Fernandes came in to this United team playing alongside Paul Pogba and also playing alongside Fred and McTominay right who are you know maybe together are pretty crap but uh, you know individually aren't that bad but Pogba had to rely on himself and Andes Pereira and people like Mara and Fellaini in the midfield. That's who he had to play with week in, week out. Maybe sometimes what I matter was, you know, on his kind of last legs, he's playing with that. And I just think people sometimes underestimate especially in this generation, the importance of systems. I think we're seeing a lot with Liverpool players, right? Um, especially this time, or Man City players and Liverpool players, especially um, during the Euros, how poor and um, average they look when they're kind of taken out of that very well-oiled functioning football team. 
and that's just the state of the current era we don't have these individual players that are just able to kind of win the games or kind of dictate games on their own they kind of play well within the system and Pogba might be one of those guys he needs to have a dedicated um you know high level defensive midfielder next to him who can kind of do all that kind of dirty work while then he goes to tr then when he and then he can then complement them um by expressing himself with the passing range and and carrying the ball from midfields into transitions the further up the pitch like that's what he needs and without that you're definitely not going to see the best in him but I guess some could argue, you know, if you're paying that kind of much money for Pogba, he needs to somehow figure out how to play a bit more disciplined, I guess, or combative. You know, I, I just don't know. I just think it's severely unfair to expect somebody to play as both of as, as both and defensive midfielder and attacking midfielder on their own. In the same way, it's, it's kind of it feels like unfair to expect Bruno Fernandes to kind of you know create all the chances and score the goals, especially when he's not that great technically. It's just again overestimation underestimation of some players and to end here it says I know there are some mitigating factors in both cases Cristiano Ronaldo overshadowing Bruno Fernandes in Portugal my United not playing proper strengths however my point is that there hasn't ever been two different examples of two players from the same club in same positions playing so different for the versus their country um, for sure um, but again I'm just thinking probably not as bad of an example I just hope that maybe this Euros has put some dampeners on people deciding Bruno Fernandes is Eric Cantona's heir apparent you know he did that really cringy photo shoot where he's got Eric Cantona's shirt under a pico or something it's just like cringe um he's clearly a good player but I don't think he's as good as some of our fans think he is um he's probably not as good as he sometimes think he is in his own head again if you want to play as a number 10 you just have to be able to kind of put your studs on the ball roll it to the side do a couple of crow you just have to kind of do that in order to kind of maneuver space and he just doesn't do it well enough. Like he doesn't even keep the ball as good enough as like a Kovacic, right? And he's not really a conventional number ten. He's more of an eight, but he's able to kind of pick up the ball like a you know like an eight slash six. And he doesn't do that well enough. He's just again he needs players around him to do that. But I think this Euro performance has definitely kind of exposed some of Bruno Fernandes' shortcomings and also shown us what Pogba can do if he's put in a team that is somewhat surrounded by quality. It just is what it is, isn't it? It is what it is. Let's move on here. Oh yeah, we had this over the weekend. People were protesting in London. Um, obviously protesting against the uh, lockdowns and um, pushing forward with the idea that they wanted things to open up on the 5th of July. So push forward the date of our freedom. And it seems like Techno Twitter people are quite divided on this sort of um, approach to doing things. Um, so they did this whole like save our scene I don't know what it was some sort of uh, process thing and part of it was that they had this um, van with a DJ booth set up where they had DJs playing and shit um, kind of you know again their way of protesting who knows what the idea or what the kind of uh, intention was behind it but for the most part people seemed to be enjoying themselves it was recording the amount of people when they went out to protest the whole streets of London were completely packed with people wall to wall and it just feels like some people are just fed up in it they're fed up they want to have their normal lives uh, back again they want to have some level of autonomy the people that are involved in the nightlife scene or dance music want to be able to go back to doing their jobs and doing what they actually love and it just feels as if like all these unnecessary delays are again unnecessary um probably without merit and they need to they need feel the need they feel obliged to fight for their scene and kind of push back against some of this nonsense that we see going on at the moment where people are waiting for a magical number of zero to get down to in terms of covid cases and deaths in order for the world to reopen and that just isn't going to happen unfortunately and like i said at the beginning of the show we're in a kind of weird predicament where they're kind of finally going to have to get to a point where they decide what what's the am amount of deaths that they're willing to kind of put up with in order to get the world back up and running and it's just kind of an unfortunate part of dealing with this kind of annoying virus that we have now at the moment so this is a video obviously on twitter it says here from this lady called hannah once that was the best day since i remember after 16 long months out of the game today reminded me exactly what i and we are missing no feeling will ever come close music is everything it's a video of a course of people playing on this flow and people in protesting and hype and enjoying themselves let's play a bit of the video no one's coming Say <laughs> mad whites of course because you know this is just the type of music that they kind of like so it is what it is and maybe they're more you know 
prone or up for going to a protest in general right you're not going to get a lot of you know unless it's something to do with our actual community you're not going to get a lot of blacks and you know brown people deciding to go on the streets of london and protest something like this because it's just not within our interest i guess for the most part so that's one observation to make out of it where's the noisy crew Don't get me wrong, it looks sloppy as fuck, but it does look like fun. Let's not deny, let's not act like that doesn't look like fun. It does look like some level of fun. It looks sloppy, it looks like everyone's there is probably like, you know, off their face on care or whatnot, but it does look slightly like fun. But this person on Twitter, Will Lester, said to save our scene, obviously taking the piss. Um, people say never too much remix is just whatever. Um, 16 long months about to get even longer after gathering of this full fast, full fest. Yeah, I get it. There is this idea that, you know, um, all these impromptu, unnecessary, illegal events are somehow going to negatively impact um, the dates that we have set forward now in terms of getting things reopened. And I kind of do understand that, right? Like, what's the point of putting this sort of stuff together when we're, we're going to be somewhat back to normal in a few weeks anyway? But then in response, maybe those people would say there is no confirmation or guarantee that once they reopen things again that they're not going to just close them back up again right so this is their kind of way of protesting against it and reminding people that regardless of what the rules are they're going to continue doing what they want which will inevitably they feel like put some pressure on the government to make sure if they do open things up again that there's no going back i don't know another guy here says it's like they couldn't wait to get back to the dance floor sorry get their phones out mm, i don't know what he says there no you can keep it so cringe I can taste the tangerine in the air from here, SMA to laughing. So I understand the sentiment, but it does feel like there is it's a there's a weird sort of like in kind of um there's a weird sort of like silent class war with these things it feels like going on. Again, the music isn't for me. It's definitely to a it's definitely catered to a specific crowd of people, but it does feel like there's a bit of like snobbery and maybe elitism when it comes to some of these sort of um pushbacks i see on social media because obviously for some weird reason i don't know why it is it seems like for the most part the tech house sort of scene are the ones that are more kind of for opening things up again sooner than rather than later you know they were the ones that are basically pushing for stuff to be reopened at the peak of the virus and they're very concerned about the clubs and all this sort of stuff and they're the ones that are mostly putting on most of the kind of quote-unquote illegal events you remember that one in the field that went on that people were getting fined for and there was loads of um you know helium cancers on the floor um it does feel like that segment of people are more prone to it and then the ones that are on social media complaining about everything are the ones that are more prone to um abide by the rules and wait until everything is perfectly safe until everyone gets back to the dance floor but again you know there's no uh there's no telling what's going to be left if you just wait for things to get back to that level and for the government to give permission so it does feel like there's a bit of a class warfare going on there. I'm not too sure what it is. I'm not too sure if this because one side of the scene feels like they're better than the other side. They feel as if like the tech house lot aren't necessarily worth anything and they're a waste of space and they're kind of like a smudge on the scene and they kind of embarrass everybody. Or if it's a thing of them just thinking, no, nah, these guys are idiots. They're putting people's lives in danger and they shouldn't be doing this. They're being selfish and blah, blah, blah. I don't really know. But it does seem like there's a little bit of a class divide going on there for the most part i would say like between maybe the working class lot of people who are probably you know more prone to vote conservative than the more middle class social media lot of people who are definitely fans of jeremy corbyn and all that shit in it i don't know that's maybe what i'm seeing again not politics not politics a political guy but just from my observation from the outdoors right you can see a couple of mixed race leads there but for the most part right it is a festival of whites it has to be said there is a random you know there's a couple of random um jamie johns looking guys in the crowd but for the most part it's just you know mad 
mad mad whites having fun and enjoying themselves and i don't think it's a bad thing you know whites having fun is not a bad thing and i want to obviously seems to enjoy it secret dj didn't like it secret dj said you're a truly dangerous person absolutely didn't encapsulate everything that's wrong with, with, um, with not just the scene i love but the world in general jesus christ damning thick entitled and selfish hell of a combo and you steal other people's music i didn't read the whole thing i just liked it so i can clip it so i can kind of come back to it as a bookmark but jesus um the rest of us are going to the wall but and doing the right thing you are making that's a weird quote isn't it with phrase the rest of us are going to the wall is okay um you are making the rest of us wait longer and longer if your protest quote unquote was about lobbying number 10 the rest of us would be there you just quote unquote want money denying covid insults 150,000 families of the dead fairly true a bit damning a little bit extreme i think these people don't really think that far ahead i think it's just you know good vibes right vibes only um no intelligence no no intelligence no foresight just vibes they're just thinking about the moment in at the moment now sort of similar to people that are throwing with these illegal sort of airbnb parties and shit people have been passing around on some very um illicit um social media apps and whatnot i've been seeing around the place people just you know they want to get their party on they want to let their hair down a bit and they don't really think too far ahead about how this could negatively impact the scene on a larger scale because i think people don't give a shit about a scene they just want to party they just want to get i don't know there needs to be this understanding there is a segment of the population that just like ha having a bit of a rave they like getting on it they like hanging out with their friends sweating listening to some songs shazamming a couple of records and you know recording some clips uploading to instagram they don't really care about the larger scene and what goes on the politics around night lineups and the diversity question they don't really care they just want to rave and you know have a dance and twiddle their thumbs in their air and bounce up and down when the drop comes in like that's all they care about and i think that's perfectly okay i think everyone can coexist but there does seem to be a little bit of a policing of the scene that I'm just not a big fan of personally, you know what I mean? And obviously calling people thick and tired and selfish is just a little bit too much for me. It comes on and says here, I miss the days when I'd be light as everyone should be holed up instead of now everyone's concerned about videoing everything, watching what everyone's going on on their phone screen, even on the drop when they ain't completely in the moment, enjoying being free, still fixated on the effing. Fairly true. Um, I'll tell you what's worse than the phones that I rave, people moaning about phones that I rave and the boring on about the good old days. That's true. That's a good point. Um, yeah, so there seemed to be some sort of a divide there going on. Hannah once doesn't seem to really care. It seems like cheers for being the reason we have to keep waiting for everything to open. Hannah once says, just me, or the tens of thousands of people who were there as well. Respectfully, completely disagree still, but it's your own. That's a bit of a snitch, Hannah. If you're, this is the thing as well. I think if you're going to be that person that wants to put on quote unquote play graves or do things, you know, that aren't necessarily allowed or might be ethically or morally, you know, bad just stand on it in it stand on it do your thing and just you know obviously be prepared that you're going to have as many, as many as many people are going to be out there kind of egging you on and saying how amazing you are there's also going to be a contingent of people that are going to you know completely um deride what you did <coughs> and call you out for on social media and you have to be okay with that you can't then start pointing fingers and saying doing the whole like what about ism what about all those people what about him and snitching on people that you were organizing a thing with or standing next to that's a bit that's a little bit um that's a bit lacking in any kind of backbone or anything you know you gotta stand on it you gotta stand on it but yeah people seem to be a bit split it says yeah if this is the shite if this shite is the scene then it can disappear without a trace tomorrow good riddance lockdown forever yeah i get it but hey man i think people have had enough man i don't know i just i just want to know the, the the like again i got a lot of time for sick of dj um but i want to know when those guys are okay with things going back to normal like when's enough going to be enough for them um there has to be a time there has to be a limit there has to be a number that everyone kind of has and it can't just be what the government said because you know the government have dealt with this completely you know in the worst way possible right they fumbled the bag on so many occasions that they just can't be trusted to kind of steer us out of this in the correct manner you know um we're in the sort of reasonable time frame they're gonna have to we're gonna have to put some level of pressure on them think about all the stuff with sort of like um what's that thing called again oh what's the grant anyway all the grants um 
and all the support that people have been having during this time of lockdowns and COVID, most of it has come off the back of people protesting and keeping up, kicking up a bit of a fuss. At the moment now, some events and festival stuff still haven't got proper insurance. That's still a big issue. So in order to, I don't know, this idea that we can just sit back, cross our arms and wait for the government to allow us to go back outdoors and do what we want, it's just a bit naive. Again, I just don't trust them to do the right thing. And there has to come a point where things just have to get back to some semblance of normality. And we just have to also accept that there are certain people within our overall dance music, electronic music scene, just have different objectives when it comes to partying and going outdoors. And some of them just want to get on it and go outside. They don't care about the overall safety of people um, in general or the impact it might have. Or maybe they might just downplay the virus and initially it solves and be people that kind of think it's a little bit over cooked a little of you know the kind of um the threat to a certain segment of people that go to their events is maybe um you know there's maybe a bit too much importance put on it and all that stuff i don't know there might be covid denies all that whatever it may be it's okay i don't necessarily see an issue with it it's okay everyone can coexist there just needs to come a point where we just get back to some sense of normality and you know this might be it for some people personally you couldn't catch me dead at one of these events but i understand the need for it i just wish we had a little bit more harmony i just wish we had more harmony talking about harmony and talking about good events off over the weekend dixon played a event in amsterdam it feels like at a place called Egeland for an event called not art or something like that right and easily easily without a shadow of a doubt this might be the best rave that i've seen during this whole like plaguey era ravey kind of thing whatever's going on this is definitely the best one and it's no coincidence that the events that are kind of quote-unquote legal and are permitted where people normal people can go and they're not just you know um the exclusive opportunity of people who are expats or rich people to go to are the ones that have the best vibe because all those play graves i saw where people were flying in you know to columbia indian all these kind of places to go and play they just look terrible because for the most part they were people especially the people that are indigenous to that country um residents citizens whatever it may be they were definitely people who are on the affluent side who were able to party and enjoy themselves during a global pandemic um that were able to maybe get themselves tested regularly able maybe to get themselves vaccinated ahead of time and it was no surprise that the parties were completely dead and um this is no surprise also that the first party that dixon played in front of a real crowd is easily the best one i've ever seen him play and you could definitely see that he enjoyed himself far more than all the other things that he's played in these other exotic locations colombia miami like i said india he might have went to somewhere in the far east he might have did the zanzibar thing he's been to a lot of places during the whole uh pl plague during the whole um, pandemic era you know some of them may be veering on the side of ethically and morally a little bit you know suspect but overall this has definitely been the best one and this is a clip here courtesy of tale of clubs featuring um dixon at this place called i think i think the part was called like no art or something like that but let's play the video and you can see how electric the vibe was That's what a bloody party looks like right that's what an absolute party actually looks like man none of this absolute faffing around that we saw in parts of what was it was it um what's her fucking name all the nina kravis things that she'd done like over the playground tough so some of the nina kravis raves especially ones who played in italy god bless that woman because you gotta pick up a check and she looks like you know nina kravis is the kind of person strikes me that you know it does a bag she's gonna go and secure it but there was this one that she played in Italy where she was just standing around doing the whole like hot girl thing, turning around, twiddling and all that sort of stuff, right? Her kind of herky-jerky dance and people were just staring at her. Don't get me wrong, she's a, a very attractive woman, but it was just more so the whole, there's a whole different vibe and 
person that comes out to those sort of parties right and they're not necessarily bothered about raving they're also just bothered about being seen or just being outdoors or maybe just just not into dancing too much but they're legitimately packed there's a packed place <coughs> if i remember correctly <coughs> it was kind of like one of those kind of coliseum sort of type shaped buildings venue sorry so all open air relatively safe i guess in that regard um, but people were just packed in like sardines, you know, shoulder to shoulder, just staring at her. No one dancing, no one doing their own thing, just quote unquote looking dead in the eye and just staring at her. She's dancing awkwardly behind the booth, and it just felt like the complete opposite of what you'd expect a party to be. People to be kind of closed in their eyes, going a bit crazy, enjoying themselves, and it was a complete opposite. And of course, this has been so refreshing to see, you know, an actual real party. And <clears throat> again, most of it has to do with the fact that it's somewhat legal. I would imagine, um, I'm not too sure what the actual stipulation is, is out there in Holland or in Amsterdam specifically around COVID, but it does feel like maybe these sort of events are somehow permitted and people, average regular day people can go and they're letting their hair down. They're appreciative of the opportunity to have to kind of rave and to dance and, you know, have one of the best DJs in the world play in front of them and they're really savoring the moment and this is what it definitely feels like. <laughs> Look at that crowd. You got the guy there in the corner with his top off, eyes closed, going absolutely mental. You know, he's off his face and just enjoying it. Lucky enough, I'm gonna be. What's that? That's gonna be the first proper rave too that I'll see. Dixon play on the 30th, is it? Village Underground. Oh, can't wait. <laughs> Oh, awesome. Look at the guy in the wheelchair being picked up, crowd surfing. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> wow. Vibe. That's what you want to see, man. That's what you want to see. But yeah, there we go. Best rave I've seen so far during the whole COVID times. People actually having a good time, having a way of an opportunity. And again, goes to show, man, all those play graves were probably good for the djs in terms of lining their pockets i'm sure during a global pandemic with no real opportunity to go and you know um play in front of people and obviously make money doing the thing that you love but in terms of enjoyment in terms of actually you know improving your skills and maybe playing in front of a crowd that actually gives a shit about what you play and are fans of you nothing beats playing in front of regular crowds in it it's a shame too because again rich people have access they have the money and opportunity and the resources to do whatever the hell they want but they don't really know how to party well. I don't know what that's about. Maybe it's because <clears throat> when you reach a certain level of wealth, the idea of maybe lowering yourself to dancing and having a good time is just a little bit whatever, right? I don't know. But they just don't know. It. Like, how, how many places have you been to where there's been people of, you know, very affluent means trying to party? It just isn't fun, right? It happens quite often. No matter what scene you're in, if you go to an art party, a fashion party, a sneaker party, and it's not you know there's no regular people in there it's just not the same vibe it just feels a little bit off <clears throat> but again and again it's no example it's no kind of surprise to see that this is definitely it was definitely a resounding success because if you go on dixon's instagram this was maybe the only one that i've actually seen him post on his instagram feed maybe because obviously it was like semi semi legal but it's the only one that he actually posted on his feed as opposed to all the other places that you play during the entire time of the pandemic this is the one that he was kind of proud to kind of put on his feed as you know part of his sort of like um djing uh cv right this is what i do this is the impact i have on the on the, the lighting as well is always pretty good at innovision dixon shows they do a really good job at coordinating all that stuff so that's <laughs> When you see people like this, when you see the, when you see a lady like that at the front with glasses on and that hat, and you see a guy like this topless, you know you're gonna have a good party. These are two people that have just come just straight up for the vibes and the music, right? 
they don't care about anything else they're not they're not worried about what trainers they're wearing what label they got on who's standing where they just want to party and usually these type of this kind of um these sort of avatars of people in dance floors are definitely the ones that you kind of look for in terms of gauging what's going to be a good party or a bad party for sure <clears throat> Yeah, man looks fun <clears throat> can't wait to go back can't wait to get back on there so definitely you know if you've got any parties coming up yourself that you're looking to head out to make sure you do make sure you do what time is it now i think i've already wasted too much of your time is it an hour already in or more than an hour yep it's already more than an hour 30 bloody hell anyway that was the exercise english episode number 470 Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your time or to have a portion of your time during this day. Thank you for allowing me to fill it up. And if uh, it's your first time, check out the show. If you're YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If it's not your first time, give me a little share. If you listen to the podcast, that before I start review, will it definitely help? I've got a few on there already. So thank you for those of you who've taken your time out of your day to leave me a little five-star review. Again, if you can spare five minutes or so to write me a quick review on the App Store or the Apple Podcast app and just put a right review specific for the podcast on the note on the podcast at Pacific on the Apple Store or if you're on Android whatever you've got definitely leave me a little review I definitely appreciate it very very much but until next time I'll see you again take care be safe peace <laughs>